Here are eight quick painting tips in less than two minutes each. Some of them are really small, as short as 50 seconds. Let's get started. Kenzie here. It's very early in the morning here in Vermont, and uh, so I have to be a little bit quiet. The rest of the fam is asleep. But what I'm doing is I'm taking some small videos that I have on my YouTube channel and putting them into a longer video. These are really great tips from probably about a year and a half ago when I first started my I started my channel two and a half years ago. But you're going to see, you know, uh, you know, there, there's a certain amount of nervousness that happens in some of them. But I think they're really good tips, and a couple of them are just entertaining. The first one is about what to say in order to keep a sale. The second one is about color canceling color. The third is called the burning phone booth. That is one of my favorites. I hope you enjoy that one. Uh, the fourth is waiting for paint to dry. That's just visual. It's just fun. Uh, the next one is the shortest video I ever made. It's only 50 seconds, and I call it a tomato movie. Uh, the next one is opera singer or plow horse, which is some advice on how you feel about your art. Uh, the next is called phantom shapes. That's only 50 seconds. Very short and self-explanatory. And the last one is somewhat philosophical and it's called does this matter? And it was a life lesson that I learned. So remember to keep the white to your paper white, your paints wet, mass for value, mix for color. Please join my YouTube channel and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Joe McKenzie here, your watercolor coach. Remember to keep the whites of your paper white, your paints wet, mask for value, and mix for color. Um, sometimes I have to stand up when I get really fired up about something, and this is what I want to talk about today. Um, I have a watercolor group on, on Facebook, and we were sharing these experiences um, that you have to be really careful what you title a painting. Now, you wouldn't think so, but here are three examples of where that's the case. Um, Shelly wrote, and she said, um, I recently missed a sale because the element I chose to add for more interest was a wadded up note. Mistakenly, I told the prospective buyer who loved all the rest of the painting what the note portrayed. She said, oh, that's so sad. I can't do sad. My phone booth. <laughs> so and she's referring to something else here. So she said, oh, she said she felt hurt, baffled and derailed. Um, but it really can affect a sale, what you, de what you decide to name a painting. And, and I've seen that painting of Shelley's. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, then uh, Deborah wrote, um, she says, oh, the painting I, that I almost sold was a wonderful composition called Angry Red Sky. I made the mistake of explaining menopausal rage and lost that deal instantly. It's what you don't say that did it. So. <laughs> no, she says what you it's what you don't say that counts sometimes. Uh, that one that was that just cracked me up no end. Now I have a friend where who lost a sale for similar reasons and it was this. It, it, I said um a person fell in love with this picture of a black horse and wanted to buy it until my friend mentioned the horse's name was Satan. <laughs> Well, that tanked the sale, and I bet this happens a lot. I try to give my paintings happy, ambiguous names, uh, and there's also an app. I forget what it's called, but it can generate titles for you. So you really do have to be careful what you title a painting because it can affect people's perceptions. <laughs> so for this painting behind me, for example, which is a pretty benign uh, landscape, um, you know, instead of calling it scenic landscape one, scenic landscape two, you know, you want to get some sort of emotional reaction. So maybe you'd say um, a beautiful uh, or um, sunlit morning. I don't know, something like that instead of the loss of love because <laughs> it, you should still paint it for all the re right reasons, but be careful when you're marketing because there are three examples of sales that didn't go through uh, once the uh, buyer found out uh, what the, the reasoning was behind the painting. And that shouldn't have affected the buyer, but it did. So uh, anyway, that's my tip for the day. Remember to keep the white your paper white. Oh, I already said that. <laughs> All right. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Joe McKenzie here, your watercolor coach. I'm here today to talk with you about a concept, and the concept is when everything is color, in essence, nothing is color. And I know that sounds very yingy yangy. What in the world does that mean? So here's my example of that. This is a painting that I did, I don't remember when, but, but a long time ago. Everything here is color, and by that I mean everything here has a color name you could attach to it. Um, even the neutrals in this case are purple. Um, 
this is a yellow. Everything is color. There are no neutrals. So in essence, although it's very vibrant, it, uh, all color sort of cancels it, itself out. Um, and now here's an example of a painting where I use neutrals a lot. And by using neutrals a lot, neutrals are gray and brown and beige and um, colors that tend to have no name really, tend to be earth tones. Uh, but when you use neutrals, what you'll find is then when you go ahead to use color, color will be much more pungent than if everything is color. And I think you can see that at work here. When you look at these two together, um, they fill up the, the frame <laughs> pretty much, but there's a very big difference. And so there can be such a thing as too much color. And as usual with a baking analogy, it's kind of like there can be too much sugar. Hard to believe when someone says to me about a dessert, gee, it's too sweet. Uh, I, I, that I can agree with. Uh, I've, I've also had people say, gee, it's too rich. I've never had that experience. Uh, so anyway, that's my tip for the day. Remember to keep the whites of your paper white and your paints wet. And come join my YouTube channel and come see me at joemckenzie.com. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Joe McKenzie here, your watercolor coach. Today what we're doing is using as few strokes as possible to paint a tomato. And my goal here was to make the tomato mostly sort of an orangey red, and then to use for the darkest elements the complement of orange, which in this case is going to be cerulean blue. Cerulean blue right out of the tube. Okay, I'm so, so far so good. And there's the first pass and I've made a neutral there for the shadow because I want the color to really pop. I've dried the tomato and now I'm coming back again telling myself don't use strokes, don't use strokes. Be very careful here. Uh, everything from the first coat is going to show up in the second coat so I don't want it to look fussy or overpainted. And then I added a background. Uh, so that's my tip for the day. Remember to keep the whites of your paper white and your paints wet. Come see me at joemckenzie.com and join my YouTube channel. See you next time. Bye-bye. Joe McKenzie here, your watercolor coach. Today is another installment of what makes you different, what makes you special, because I think we have to ask ourselves these questions all the time, because I think it impacts our art all the time. I've thought a lot about it and come to conclusions about the kind of artist I am. And I want to preface this by saying it is not a put down of myself. It's a real, just a realization of who I am, authentically who I am in the world. Uh, I am not an opera singer. I am not highly trained or skilled at this thing. Uh, called painting. I am, however, what I call a sing around the campfire kind of painter. I will show up and I will sing and I will mostly be on tune, but I won't be doing anything that blows anybody's socks off, but I will enjoy being there with you and participating in the act of creating song. Also, I am not uh, the winner of any kind of horse race. I'm not going to come in first. I'm never going to win a big competition. I'm never going to be the best. No question about that. But what I am is I'm a plow horse. I will show up every day and participate. I will plow that field. And at first the field will seem an impossible thing to do, but simply by participating every day and showing up, that, pl that field will get plowed and I will be able to plant corn and have a harvest. So I'm very aware that I am not these things. I'm not highly skilled and I'm not highly gifted. No question about that. But I am these things. And these things can still take you a long way. So that's my thoughts for today. Remember to keep the white your paper white and your paints wet. Come see me at joemckenzie.com. Enjoy my YouTube channel, and I'll see you next time. Bye -bye. Joe McKenzie here, your watercolor coach. Today I'm going to give you the best lesson that I didn't teach. This is from Stapleton Kearns, and you can find him on his blog. He has so many interesting articles. And this one I think it was entitled, Would Your Painting Be Better With a Burning Phone Booth in It? And every time I do a painting since reading this article, I've asked myself that question. Would my painting be better with a burning phone booth in it? And if the answer is no, then I have a pretty good painting. And if the answer is yes, then I've got some trouble. All right, so let's take a look at this painting. This painting is by Dirk Van Assertz, a 17th century painter. Uh, and it's a painting um, that's titled The Old Mill on a Dreary Afternoon and it remained unsold. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> anyway, it was on exhibit, and it was said that people stopped by it, and uh, and children were slightly disturbed by it. 
At one point, um, the artist was asked uh, what was the meaning of the painting, and he said it was the illusion of meaning is the meaning, which I think was a 17th century way of saying, my art, my rules. <laughs> So anyway, so let's take a look now at the painting without the burning phone booth in it. And you can see the tree on the right and the windmill on the left, and they sort of balance out each other almost completely. And although it's beautifully painted, uh, you know, you sort of have to admit it feels like there's something missing. Now, I'm a great fan of uh, space and the painting of, th of space between things, but for some, you... For me, and maybe for you as well, there's something lacking about this painting. So, um, so what do you do about that? Well, if you have this problem, uh, this is one of the ways that Stapleton said uh, the burning phone booth uh, solves the problem. So let's see what the painter does. Okay, he puts the burning phone booth in, and he puts it just not in the absolute middle. If you draw a line down the middle of the painting, the burning phone booth is almost all on the left side of that line. So suddenly that phone booth becomes the focal point, although it's slightly off-center. It dominates the middle, it has bright color, it removes the gloominess, and it breaks up that uh, strong horizontal that the painting had without it. So now let's take a look at the painting without the burning phone booth in it and see if we, um, if we respond the way we did before we, we, had, we, we saw it uh, analyzed. And there it is again. And you can see it is indeed lacking. So the lesson from Stapleton Kearns about this was to ask yourself when you do a landscape or maybe any painting, ask yourself, would your painting be better with a burning phone booth in it? And if the answer is yes, then you have some solving to do. Uh, so that's my tip of the day. Remember to keep the whites of your paper white and your paints wet. Mass for value, mix for color, and I will see you next time. Okay, bye-bye. Joe McKenzie here, your watercolor coach. One of the best pieces of advice I got was from my mother, and it happened when I was moving into my dorm room in college, so I would have been about 21 at the time. And um, I didn't really think her advice uh, meant a whole lot. You know, I kind of thought um, I was more interested in, um, in learning than I was in things at the time. Anyway, I was moving into the dorm room and um, it brought the bedding and, and some old furniture or whatever it was. And I grabbed a, a uh, garbage bag, you know, a... a, 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 a grocery bag to use as my wastebasket. And she said, oh no, no, uh, tomorrow we're gonna go and buy a real wastebasket. And I said, well, I don't need it. You know, I can throw things in this, it's just as useful, what's the difference? And she said, the difference is if you think that all you're worth is that paper bag, then that's all you'll ever be. And I thought at the time that that was really ridiculous because I just took it literally, like you're only worth the cost of a trash can. <laughs> I just, you know, zoom, kind of went right over me. But we went shopping the next day and we bought a um, wastebasket. You know, maybe it was decorative, I don't even remember. But throughout the years, that piece of advice has come to me over and over again. When I think about being um, kind to myself or treating myself in a certain way, or even when it comes to treating other people, and I think, um, I hear her voice and that she's saying to me, think of what you're worth. Think of what this, how this reflects on you. Now she was not talking about going out and buying the most expensive thing ever. My mother was one of the most thrifty people I ever knew. Thrifty people I ever knew. She would drive around the block at least four or five times to not have to put 25 cents in the meter. <laughs> so... <laughs> It was, those two pieces of advice were really uh, yingy and yangy to me, uh, but it taught me a lot. It, ta it taught me a, an, an awful lot. It taught me about aesthetics. It taught me about treating yourself well. And I think the other thing she was trying to impress upon me was how do you appear to others and that that matters. So I'm curious to know what was the piece of advice that you got in your life that meant a lot to you? And did you take that advice? Was it the right advice at the right time? Or did it go right past you and it was only later on reflection that you realized that that uh, was really useful? 
Uh, so those are my thoughts for the day. Remember to keep the whites of your paper white and your paints wet. Mask for value, mix for color. And um, join my YouTube channel. And I will see you ne next time. Bye-bye.